Every business needs some competition, right? A little corporate rivalry to keep you sharp and on your feet. Well, I'm sure you and your teammates are no stranger to it. Especially if you've heard the distant whir of a gravity repulsion drive, smelled the distinct scent of ozone as a laser just barely misses your beard, or... That's right, I'm talking about rivals. A ubiquitous thorn in our side since they arrived here on Hoxies, if we aren't counting the bugs. And the literal thorns in our sides on occasion. This video will be coalescing all of our hard work in the last year or so collecting data cells and racks, as well as the product of the science team working tirelessly to crack them for any info on our friends here. I'll try to make it worthwhile for the veterans among you who fought back in the initial incursion and escalation, as well as those of you who are relatively new to the company wondering about the inorganic threats that keep interrupting your missions. Grab a cold brew, get ready, and get comfortable. We're booting up. I'm actually booting up. Ho hold on. Okay, I'm gonna start with a brief overview of the sparse background information we have on the rivals. We are sadly missing many details since we weren't even remotely prepared to collect data on what was happening in the early days of the incursion, but this is the most complete narrative we can muster thus far. According to incomplete snippets of info pilfered from data racks, the rivals are, as far as we know, a fully autonomous mechanized operational force sent from an unknown interstellar origin somewhere outside of the Hoxian system's orbit. I know, I know, real shocker there. But we do know they aren't from somewhere within Hoxie's orbit, that's something, right? They blinked in sometime around the early spring of 3364 GCC, or 6823 DHC, depending on what calendar you're using, and refused all hails for communication from Rig 17. Strange behavior, but it's not normally our prerogative to interfere with any long-range spacecraft in the Outer Rim, especially ones that mind their own business, right? Long-range scanners detected what looked like space debris floating towards the planet, apparently jettisoned from the freighters. We saw this and assumed it was a convoy of craft simply offloading some trash on what they assumed to be an uninhabited planetoid in an unremarkable system. Easy mistake to make, and nothing harmful, even if it was a little rude. Well, what we didn't know at the time was that the debris actually turned out to be a massive swarm of construction drones and raw materials jettisoned towards the planet's surface. The freighters jumped away with little fanfare after a few hours, time passed, and mining operations went on without a hitch for a few weeks until we ran into some unwelcome guests squatting in our caves. And I'm sure you know the story from there, right? Our missions were hampered left and right by our new friends. They left machines all over the caves and began collecting data on the resources we were after, not to mention attempting to immolate employees that dared to get close enough to any of their stuff. Enter incursion and escalation, our first major clashes in what was to become a long war of attrition. The question remains, how did they show up and proliferate so suddenly without large-scale planetary boring? The answer seems to be that they have constructed themselves out of found materials, extracting them from the sediment itself in small amounts with behavior not unlike a hive. The parts we detected entering the planet seemed to have been materials for building a single caretaker unit. It couldn't have been more than that. The speculated origin point of the entire incursion, in fact. They dropped them over the glacial strata, taking advantage of the permafrost, ice, and exposed cracks in the glacial surface to go deeper. This seems to be the only way to explain things the way they went down. There was no large-scale invasion force in orbit, no massive disruption to speak of really until we encountered them already built and ready to fight us, underground. And as we now know, we would know if they had punched holes in the planet's crust to insert massive structures like caretakers. We see the less subtle ways in which the CHX-4 lithophage pathogen has been entering the caves, it's kinda hard to miss. We can only assume that the rivals are made of materials found on Hoxies 4 a hostile force made of the very minerals we came here to collect in an ironic twist of fate, really. And like the actual infectious nature of the lithophage, the rivals are going to keep replicating themselves and bothering us until we exterminate them completely, unfortunately. But enough broad conjecture about origins, let's get into the nitty gritty of the uh, thus far encountered units that they've been throwing at us down there. We'll start with the smallest of the rivals' combat ready units, the Shredder. 
Individually weak, these units are often found in groups of exceeding five or so, making up for their fragility with numbers and some truly nasty melee damage. Their purpose outside of reducing you to ribbons is clearing debris, boring tunnels for construction nanites to build and run cables through, as well as discouraging the wildlife from meddling with equipment if needed. In combat, they will try to get close, spinning their sharp external shells and diving at you in an attempt to give you a very much unwelcome beard cut or severe lacerations. They're small and therefore hard to hit with most firearms, especially when combined with their natural agility. It's still preferable to kill them at range if you're a good enough shot, but a reliable alternative to this and a great way to save ammo is to use your pickaxe. They go down in a single hit, so hit them before they have a chance to hit you. Simplest way to deal with them. But I will admit, easier said than done. One observation I've made is that while approaching you, they will move erratically, but will tend to return to the spot they were just before they attacked. If one manages to get a hit in on you, remain calm and focus on where it was to deliver the death blow. Taking a hit isn't ideal, but it is a good way to get rid of them without frantically searching. It should go without saying, but AoE damage, especially damage fields and explosions are fantastic at dealing with these little things. Engineers should be sure to have their sentries up if they expect to be dealing with shredders too. Come on, you gotta remember this guys. Drillers' arm drills are also fantastic at killing shredders when they get close and swarm you. A word of warning, don't underestimate shredders in all the chaos of a fight. They want to go unnoticed until it's too late to deal with them, so be sure to not give them that chance. Our best guess with these little guys is that their primary purpose isn't really combat, but the rivals are resourceful and will divert any shredders in the area to assist when threats are detected. Being cheap on resources makes them perfect fodder to send at us while the bigger units do the real damage. They are found around any and all rival constructs, a clear and consistent threat to any bot-busting team. Next we have the trio of turret installments the rivals use to defend their so-called territory in our caves. I'm lumping these together since they're almost always found together when encountered. They have burst turrets for sustained suppressive fire, repulsion turrets for blocking weapons fire and keeping you back, and sniper turrets for dealing kill shots on anyone out of cover. All three of these installments are fairly sturdy, able to withstand some punishment before going down. They do have weak points, though, mainly where all their sensors are located. Another thing that all three share, along with almost all the other rival tech units, is a weakness to high temperatures. This weakness to heat, while a common issue for any computer, seems to be a major design flaw and an exploitable weakness in the rival's internal structure, and one you'd think they would have attempted to mitigate more than they already have if they had expected us. Conjecture on my and the science team's part leans towards this being a sign that most of these units are meant for operations where they expected little to no actual resistance. They seem to be designed to deter unarmed meddlers, not heavily armed dwarves with questionably legal firearm modifications and two liters of ale in their systems. They're also not protected very well due to them being mass-produced units. Forgoing heavy heat insulation in favor of being lightweight, modular, and easy to produce. The metal alloy their chassis are made of is actually very interesting. Being custom forged by unknown processes, likely in ways only advanced construction nanites can manage, it consists of a nano-weave structure that resembles bronze but is structured on a molecular level to withstand much more kinetic force than a sheet of metal with the same thickness normally could. This makes their plated parts resistant to kinetic impact to a surprising degree. This doesn't protect them from heat though. Due to the metal weave being perforated on a microscopic scale to save on material usage and reduce weight, meaning that you can fry the internal components and disable the magnetic fields that keep their parts held together quite easily actually. They also don't have the same RGB cooling system we installed on units like Haxi, which not only keep him cool, but also make him look cool as hell while doing his job. Isn't that right, Haxi? These units, and all others, are also weak to melee damage too. The standard issue mining picks we supply you guys with just happen to be great at dealing damage to rivals. This is partly due to your freakish dwarven strength, yeah yeah yeah, pat yourselves on the back guys, whatever, but also due to the micro vibration on the impact surface of the picks being great at ripping that nano weave metal apart. So yeah, once again, trying to beat something to death with your equipment is actually a great strategy. 
Oh, the turrets come with another weakness too. Since they're rooted to the ground, destroying the terrain beneath them will destroy them along with it. Be it with tunnels or explosives, doesn't matter. When dealing with them, try to remember that each turret type's attacks can be evaded in their own ways. Burst turrets aren't great at tracking, so circle strafing them is sufficient enough. Repulsion turrets always follow an alternating pattern, so if you can get into the rhythm you can sidestep the barriers to get in close. And finally, sniper turrets are accurate and will try to lead shots, but can be juked if you change direction last second. You wait for the targeting laser to vanish, and in that brief moment before they fire, they have to stop moving. So that's your window of opportunity to avoid getting hit. Or, you know, use cover. That works too. Now, you'll find these things all over the place around a caretaker control nexus. Those turrets being directly connected with the caretaker as defense and surveillance measures. On missions with confirmed rival presence, they will be found around a localized turret controller. These are hackable, and doing so will instantly destroy all turrets in the area. They are heavily guarded, but very worth it if you can slip past the defenses and use your PDA. Bursters and snipers can be snuck past, but you should be sure to remove repulsors if they are too close to or level with the turret controller since they can hit you even through terrain and stop your hacking. As for the controller itself, we'll get back to those pretty soon. While these stationary defenses are simple in concept, they are still very dangerous if you rush in. Take things slow and remove them with care because losing entire mining teams to a bunch of stationary security units is, uh, well, it's kind of embarrassing, guys. Really. Our next subject is the ever-present patrol bot, the primary fighting force and workhorse of the rivals. These things are no joke, boasting high durability, speed, and firepower enough to take on one of you dwarves toe to toe. I consider them to be a duelist of sorts, an enemy considered to be a real threat in any situation and of the highest priority. They can snipe at long range with deadly accuracy, fire suppressive bursts, tackle you directly, and even fire homing missiles. Oh, and they can fly. Their purpose as a unit is as obvious as it sounds, to patrol and eliminate threats. It's also speculated that they serve as command signal relays for caretakers and nemesis units when they aren't needed in combat. They can be found roving in groups of two or three, often accompanied by shredders, phased into caverns by the same teleportation technology caretakers use for their phase bombs. This means they can show up pretty much anywhere when rival equipment or territory is under attack, so stay vigilant and listen for that telltale boom sound that they make when they're nearby. As for weaknesses, they have several. Their head is particularly vulnerable, containing many of the patrol bot's critical sensory and control components. Shooting that part should be an obvious choice. They also share the heat weakness and melee weakness that I mentioned before, so having a source of ignition and your pickaxe at the ready is advised. Fighting patrol bots is all about taking advantage of their movement. They're erratic and fast, but they do have to slow down to fire at you, which is also your chance to hit back, but harder. They will noticeably slow down when aiming sniper fire and when getting ready to fire missiles, meaning you will want to exploit these windows while also being ready to strafe or find cover if they get a shot off. They also get close to you when rolling on the ground, which is also a great time to try and land a power attack as you sidestep their path. No matter what, remember, these things can and will chase you anywhere in the cave. Anything you have at your disposal to destroy them right away should be used without hesitation. If you can use heat build up to your advantage, you can try and overheat their systems, but don't get hung up on it. Hit that weak point and take them down. If they want a duel, show them that a dwarf never backs down from a fight, especially to a damn machine. Now, there is the occasional moment where a patrol bot will shut down and stop moving instead of just exploding. In these moments, if you act quickly, you can take advantage of its system failure and attempt to hack it. Your PDA will easily be able to handle it, even if their bizarre systems require a bit of timing and finesse to crack. What we actually do here is upload a stripped down version of the Betsy targeting subroutines to the patrol bot. We still haven't cracked the logic and the rival programming well enough to be able to directly overwrite the whole machine, so instead we simply hijack it with another program. Apparently, Betsy's programming is so wildly unoptimized that her power efficiency is laughably bad, only made up for with her robust hardware preventing that from being an issue. Rival power systems are... 
not so robust. Once you upload the Betsy subroutines to the patrol bot, it will begin to lose health over time, the power usage ravaging its systems and slowly reducing integrity until it's within a hair's breadth of exploding. The problem takes care of itself, really. Dwarven engineering never ceases to amaze me. The software is a complete nightmare, and you guys still use CRT monitors all over the rig, but your robots never break down no matter what ham-fisted solutions you find. I... I'd be mad if I didn't have to rely on it. A good thing to mention while patrol bots are fresh in our minds is the rival prospector. I'm sure you've seen a few of these things wandering about the caves, even if they are a bit rare these days. They're actually not a combat unit, but are still a high priority regardless, due to the valuable data cells they carry within. Prospectors seem to be tasked with collecting dirt and mineral samples, likely getting survey data on Hoxie's 4's geological compositions. The scary part is that this seems to betray the rival's current objective on Hoxie's 4 right now, survey data collection. This means we are likely encountering a scouting and research focused force, and they've already brought this much firepower with them. That's why we need to try and stop them from getting data off-world, because I really don't want to see what their main operations will look like when they find out how unique Hoxie's 4 really is. This planet is a gem, even if that gem is serrated, radioactive, and has teeth, and is constantly trying to murder us. Plus, then I'll have to write even more reports about the stuff, and I'm overworked as it is. Um, uh, where was I? Uh, oh, prospectors. So they collect data, load it into their cells by writing it directly into super dense silicon crystals and deposit that hard data into data deposits found around the caves. Which by the way have equipment that attaches directly with the prospector's underside from the looks of it. These serve as upload stations that transmit data to the caretaker nexus and to be ultimately stored on the final copy in the data vault beneath the inverted pyramid. Your job here is easy. Shoot the hell out of them and rip the data cell out. It's never really that easy though. What can reduce hassle is if you and your team shoot the bright orange parts on the back end. They're a crucial component of its propulsion methods and will slow it down significantly if destroyed while also doing some nasty damage. Prospectors will send out distress calls to the caretaker nexus for support to be phased into the cave in the form of patrol bots and shredders. They will also become briefly immune with a short-lived shield after sustaining damage so keep that in mind and don't waste ammo. Make sure you choose a good time and place to pick a fight, or things are going to get much more difficult for you. Especially since encounters are random and you're likely not to have a bot killer build equipped. It's a good idea to destroy these things in the gaps between swarms, or before major operational milestones like armor and heartstone extractions or refinery pump sequences, but it's your call really. The bottom line is that these units are clearly some form of intelligence gathering aspect of their operation and are of high priority for any mining team. You see them less these days, but be prepared for the event that you do. Oh, prospectors are also an example of the rivals using biomimicry in their unit designs. A peculiar theme we've noticed, and more evidence that they originated at least some of their designs while here on Hoxie's 4. Prospectors specifically share a few similarities with silicate harvesters if you look at the two side by side. Weird, right? I'll mention these details later with other units if it comes up. Finally, in the known roster of rival units, we have the nastiest of the bunch, the rival Nemesis. These units started popping up after the rivals in DRG had been clashing in the caves for a few months, seemingly as a response to us discouraging them from building more caretakers. They are best described as slow-moving hunter-killers with the express purpose of searching for our mining teams and eliminating them. They are heavily armored and equipped with hard light shield emitters similar to but much more powerful than those found on the stationary security turrets. The rival's shield tech seems to need a lot of power to operate, and it can be assumed that the power source for each unit has to be carefully managed in order to maintain these barriers. Caretakers need two external generators for that reason. This is also why you see them drop their shields when entering combat and why repulsor turrets can only fire in small short-lived bursts of shield rather than in continuous shape. Turrets do this for another reason too, they cannot fire projectiles through them unlike our gunner's standard issue DRG shield projectors which simply use an electromagnetic field. The hard light emitters they use create surfaces that are impervious and can cause damage to anything they come into contact with, which they use to good effect. 
Rather than being purely a defensive measure, the Nemesis uses these hard light barriers to disintegrate and pack terrain, giving it the ability to dig when needed. It can also project a short-lived hard light barrier in the direction of the source of damage, allowing it to approach you steadily without taking too many hits. This is good for them since they aren't equipped with any ranged weaponry. Weird design choice, really. A speculative reason for this is that their onboard barrier generator needs all the power it can get to charge so they have forgone the laser weaponry and left that job to the patrol bot units. What it lacks in range, it more than makes up for in sheer deadly crushing power. If a nemesis catches you in its grasp, you're as good as dead. Those telescopic arms are no joke and once they lock on, the only real way to escape is by breaking line of sight with terrain or having heightened senses equipped. Keep your distance. The Nemesis is equipped with nano-weave armor plating around its body, meaning that armor-breaking ammunition will be useful for exposing its internals. Once you've dealt enough damage to it to do so, you can hit the important stuff and take them down with enough sustained power, or, if you've come prepared, actual fire to ignite and overload it just like its smaller cohorts. It's a bit difficult to ignite one of these, but if your entire team can focus fire damage together, it is possible. The question is, why are Nemesis units so large and cumbersome? Don't get me wrong, they're still scary and effective enough at killing DRG employees that they still deserve the utmost caution, but still, it's a really strange design choice that almost seems like a mistake at first glance. One theory of mine is that the Nemesis is not simply a hunter-killer unit, but a mobile control unit capable of defending itself. Take a look at the turret controllers in this context, and it seems pretty obvious. Once a nemesis finds and determines an area is suitable and clear of threats, it seems that they plant themselves in the ground and begin converting their extra parts into construction operations, like a scaled down version of a proper caretaker control nexus. I would assume this is the rival's way of trying to reclaim parts of the caves from our meddling without having to spend the time to create a full command center with the exorbitant resource cost of a caretaker proper. This has a few interesting implications. One. The rival's resources are not so plentiful to allow for complete freedom for their purposes, and our efforts have forced them to adapt and make compromises. Two, they can adapt on the fly. A bit of good and bad, really. The fact that the Nemesis seems to have been made to order as a special gift for us here on Hoxie's 4 means the rivals are flexible and are trying new things now that it's clear that we are a real threat to them. The biggest evidence for this, really, is definitely not lost on you guys. You've heard it yourselves, I'm sure. That eerie call the Nemesis uses to lure in unsuspecting miners with what sounds like calls for help from a fellow comrade? While it may have worked the first few times, I would assume it doesn't fool a majority of those who hear it now. Often serving as a warning call for the approach of a Nemesis, it's even picked up on a few of your, uh, more interesting celebratory mannerisms out in the field. Y you know, the... the I, it's not official, but I'm not sure I like the implications here. G because what if the call is not intended as a lure so much as a form of psychological attack? The reason I believe this is due to the other phrases the Nemesis can utter when it's in trouble or defeated. While shutting down, it uses the same dwarven voice to speak phrases clearly not meant to lure or intimidate. I'll play a few field recordings now. Nobody asked you, Betsy. <clears throat> anyway. Does that sound like a recording to you? I mean, of a dwarf. I mean, it was a recording, but like, of a dwarf. I don't think so. That, and the fact that it talks about murdering us when in close proximity for no other purpose than to intimidate, makes me think it's safe to say that this is a vocal synthesizer being used by a form of artificial intelligence specifically crafted to profile and antagonize dwarves even to the point of being programmed with an almost personal pathological grudge against them. I, I mean, it's a robot, right? What purpose would it serve to give something sentience just to hunt and kill us? Hey, I'm, maybe we're just that special. Just make sure you focus fire, backpedal, and keep track of the thing when you encounter one and you'll probably be okay. 
And even if you aren't okay, try to get some good shots of the thing with your suit cameras. We're still researching these things. Alright, that about covers all the units our teams have encountered in the caves so far. The rivals are still a threat to us, even if they've hunkered down and dug deeper into the plant to avoid us. We're seeing caretakers at much deeper elevations now, so you'll occasionally see them pop up in your itineraries for deep dives. Try not to complain too much. We need the research, and the fact that they're digging deep might mean they know something we don't. Or, and perhaps more plainly, they're avoiding the whole lithophage situation. Can't blame them, to be honest. Ever since it started showing up on Hoxie's 4, the rivals have avoided it like... Well, like the plague. I doubt the infection could do anything to them, but it might be interfering with operations all the same, and to them it's not worth dealing with. Shame, really, because the lasers would come in handy. Another unsubstantiated theory I've heard floating around is that the rivals are actually here to survey Hoxie's 4 before and after the effects of lithophage corruption. Maybe their entire purpose here is to document the effects in order to learn ways to combat it for their creators. It would explain why they are entirely inorganic and autonomous, minimal loss for getting too close to the infection. Only problem is that they seem to be avoiding anything rockpox so far, so I suppose we won't know for a while. All that said, we only have one unit left, the caretaker itself, which demands a full briefing all on its own. For now, use this information to deal with and possibly learn anything new about our rivals while you're out in the field. I'll compile reports from the science team and get back to you as soon as I can. See you then, and until next time, rock and stone. Also, this research wouldn't be possible without my lovely patrons. Averdic Tallow, Agent Maxwell, Kyoto Sasukio, Flaggleblast, Autogyro, Infraray, KyleWee21, Loopbugs, Octopane, Raging Ripto, Sergeant Rattlebones, Steamstuck Dragon, A Flying Ostrich, Cole Best Yen, Codex, Gabriel PBC, The Flannel Man, Theodore Argish, and Von Boomslang. Thank you, you guys. Rock and Stone a second time just for you. Betsy, you've been parked in this spot for days. Do you need maintenance again? What's behind the door? Nothing. Really? Nothing. Okay, open the door. What door? Oh, don't play dumb. You wouldn't be guarding it if... What was that? Nothing. Come on, you can't keep a rival nemesis in the space rig, Betsy? Aw, can't we keep him? He's my friend now. No, absolutely not. I already have enough things on my plate right now. I do not need to be hiding another thing on this rig, including you, if you haven't forgotten. I had him de-armed. You had him what? I shot both his arms clean off. He's harmless now, and so cute. That is... that is so... F you do realize that thing could be transmitting its location any second now? I shot now? that part out too. He only sent out... 5,283 distress pings. He was such a good sport. Why are you like this? I... Look, I don't have time for this. I've been talking about robots for months now. No more robots. Please, just no more. Just... Just keep this thing in the hangar storage here and don't let anyone else see. I'll shoot anyone who tries to open the door. You have my word. That's not what I... I'll be back. Don't move. Thank you. Goodbye. These robots are going to get me fired.